Hi, my name is Lauren Bierkus, and I'm the author of Les Monstres, uh, Les Lumineuses. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the inspiration for Les Monstres today. I was very interested in, Det in Detroit as a city. It seems to be this place which is very broken, very dilapidated. It's a symbol of the death of the American dream and also the beginning of the American dream, the birth of the American dream, the death of the American dream, and the possible resurrection. So I went to Detroit to go and get the story behind the pictures that we've all seen on the internet of these beautiful ruins of our civilization. And it was very exciting to, to go there and to, and to stand in the ruins of our civilization. It was haunting and evocative and it's so strange because it's not, it's not the Parthenon, it's not the Colosseum, it's, it's us. And it's terrifying, it's, it's such a feeling of being in an apocalypse. But there's a lot more to Detroit than that, and I find that there is a lot of life in the city. It's not, it's not only this abandoned, broken place, it is also a place where people live, and they have hopes and ambitions, and they raise their kids, and they have dreams. So I really wanted to kind of explore that aspect of it as well. On my research trip to Detroit, I interviewed a lot of very interesting people. Uh, you know, of course I do my research on Google Maps, and I read a lot of books, and um, you know, I do all of that stuff. But there's nothing quite like going to a place uh, of standing in an old decaying movie theater and having, you know, there, there are ruined curtains rotting on the walls and there's a row of chairs and one of them has been pulled out like a rotten tooth. And there's black squirrels scampering around in the weeds outside and there's shafts of sunlight coming through the hole in the roof and dust motes swirling in the light. And that's all great until you realize it's probably asbestos and you're breathing it in right now. Um, which is a problem with old buildings. But I also wanted to interview people and, and spend time talking to people. And I went downtown. I've never seen such a hipster place in my life. Um, I saw Google Glass for the first time. And I interviewed uh, teenage theater geeks. I went to go and visit them at their performing school. And they forced me to do their theater warm-up exercises with them. And they told me really interesting things, which I couldn't have anticipated or expected. Uh, they talked about social media and how they all knew the nickname of a girl whose name was, her nickname was Chlamydia. And even before they started at the school, they knew that that was her nickname. And this thing was haunting her and it's going to haunt her f throughout her entire life. She'll, she's never going to be able to get away from this because of social media. And kids at other schools know about this. And this humiliation just spreads like a virus. So that became a very important theme in the book. The teenagers also talked about how um, there's that great Shakespeare quote, all the world is a stage and we are merely players. And they said that what's changed is that now social media is the stage. And the rest of their lives is what is happening in anticipation of putting on that show. And it's, it's so interesting to see how that has changed the world. And it was very exciting to like, write about the internet and to write about how, how technology has shaped who we are right now. And, and how we express ourselves and how we curate ourselves. And that also became a very big theme in the book. I was very interested in getting different personal perspectives on Detroit. And I went and worked in the soup kitchen for the day um, at an amazing church organization. And after I finished serving uh, in the kitchen, I went out and I spoke to people and I told them who I was and why I was there, that I was a novelist, that I was looking to understand their lives and their experience of the city. And I met the most remarkable man, uh, James Harris. He's a volunteer there, and he, he helps people find jobs. And he's the most exuberant, interesting, cool guy. And he also has this incredible history. And when he was 13 years old, his mother was a sex worker, and he was her protection. And he would sometimes have to take his gun, his 38, and go down and save his mom from some guy who was hassling her. And when he was 13 years old, he came home with his brother and sister, and he found his mom bleeding to death. Someone had stabbed her. And it was her twin sister's boyfriend. Uh, he'd mistaken her for the wrong sister. And, she, and now he knew the guy's name, and he knew who it was. So he went upstairs, and he got his gun, and he went out, and he found the guy, and he shot him dead in the street. And was then in and out of jail for years. The system completely failed him. He had really interesting perspectives on God, for example. He talked about how God was not someone who, he, he did believe in God, but he also felt that God had betrayed him because who would let this happen to a child and who would let what he went through happen to a child? 
So he went to AA to try and get off the drugs, and he talked about how um, in AA you're supposed to have a higher power, Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, well, my higher power is my chair, because it supports me wherever I am. And that fed very much into my character, TK. And TK is not James Harris, um, but they share a childhood, and they share some mannerisms and some ways of speaking. And it's the first time I've ever based someone on a character like that, or a character on someone like that. Um, and he was just the most inspiring man. We've stayed in touch, and he loves the book, and he loves, he loves the character of TK. And it was just very exciting to be able to bring that reality in. When I first got to Detroit, I had a couple of contacts, um, and a, a friend's aunt came and picked me up. And she was a wonderful lady, very kind, very enthusiastic about Detroit. Um, but she wanted to show me things like the Yacht Club. And I was like, this isn't really the Detroit that I've come here to see. And I, we stopped at the old historic pottery, Pawabic pottery. They make the most beautiful tiles. Um, they're renowned around the world. And in the pottery, I met this young artist and photographer. And he was very cool, and he had these dreadlocks, and he was just really hip. And I was like, you, you were showing me around town. And he was a bit taken aback um, because this crazy woman just kind of pounced on him. And he was like, yeah, OK, fine. You know, let's go out tonight, and I'll show you some of the, the art scene. And that was exactly what I needed. It was amazing. And he drove me around, and he introduced me to other artists. And, and I, was, I was shameless. I would take an artist for coffee or take a cop for coffee, and we'd have a conversation. And then I would say, so um, what are you doing now? And they'd be like, well, I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm a freelancer. I'm an artist. Uh, I suppose I have to do some work. I'm like, how about you drive me around? How about you show me your Detroit? And people did. They were so generous with their time. And I think it was because they were excited to show, to show me an aspect of Detroit that wasn't covered. You know, Detroit becomes this huge cliche of the ruins and the decay and maybe some urban farming. Um, but they wanted to show me the life in Detroit. And it felt very personal and very, it was amazing. It was an amazing journey. So I wrote the whole book. Uh, I, I went to Detroit on a research trip. Then I wrote the first draft. And then I realized that I had some holes and some gaps that I needed to plug. So I went back to Detroit. And I, I phoned the young, hip guy from the pottery, uh, Robert David Jones. And I said, listen, can I pay you to be my tour guide, drive me around, facilitate? Uh, because otherwise, I'm going to be jet lagged. I'm going to be on the wrong side of the road. It's just going to be a disaster. And he said, absolutely fine. I arrive at the airport. It's cold. It's November. Um, I'm standing on the chilly concourse looking around for him. And there's this big black van. And, and I phone him, like, where are you? And he's like, no, I'm in the black van. I was like, oh. OK. And it looks like a murder wagon. It really does. It looks like he's going to kidnap me and like cut me up. And I'm like, how well do I know this guy, actually? And I get in, and I'm like, hey, Robert. Haha, <laughs> this looks like a murder wagon. And he's like, oh, no, it's not a murder wagon. Don't worry about that. It's, it's a hearse. Um, it belongs to the family funeral home that is right next door to his parents' house. And he, he asked him if he could borrow it. And there was a dead old lady in it 20 minutes before he picked me up from the airport. <laughs> So that's how I got driven around Detroit, was in a hearse, um, in the big black murder hearse. And, but it, was, it just kind of fed into the experiences. And you know, meeting amazing artists, going to cool art galleries, um, it, was, it was just there is such life and there is such spirit and fire in Detroit. And I think partly that is in reaction to the, how broken the city is, that I think art, art and artists often need something to rub up against, um, to you light a fire because there is darkness. And I think that's partly what makes it Detroit art scene so very exciting. I met wonderful people in Detroit, like uh, Detective Robert Haig. And he uh, was in the Detroit police force for a very long time, for 20 years. He's actually written a memoir about his experiences. And we talked very deeply about you know, what he went through and, and everything else. He's also written a kid's book, which is called Who Can, Baby Can. And um, he's now retired, and he's, he's uh, you know, getting into that. And it's, it was just really fun to like, meet these interesting people. I also interviewed the world's most gorgeous taxidermist, uh, Mickey. And she, she's just phenomenal. Uh, she's the, one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. She's young, and she offers taxidermy lessons. I found her on the internet. And uh, she's normally based in Detroit, but now she travels all over. And she told me the most strange, bizarre, disgusting stories about taxidermy. And we kind of role played the scenario. Uh, we, ch we chatted via Skype. And we talked about how, um, what, what the conversation would be between the detectives trying to find out if this was an evil taxidermist or not who committed the murders. And she explained that taxidermy, you know, it's, it's about skinning the animal. And she described it as 
It's like skinning a very gross orange. And it was such a beautiful description I had to use it in the book. It was amazing. And the story about the kangaroo that's in the book is also true. It happened to her. It's a real life detail that you couldn't have made up. And it's, it's, it, it, all of this stuff fed into the book. It was so much fun to be able to use this. Mm -hmm.